thank you very much for having me, everyone. It's lovely to be here. I'm grateful to Eugene for the um, for the invitation and for persevering with the invitation to uh, to join with you. It really is a privilege. Um, each contact that I've had through mission and also through speaking at a house party similar to this back in 2014 is, or with Grace Point has always been an enormous encouragement. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, let's pray as we come to God's word. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that you reveal yourself to us in it, that we might know you and love you and serve you and live the way that you would have us live. We thank you above all that this word reveals to us the gospel of salvation, a sure and certain forgiveness of our sins for those who trust in Jesus. And we thank you that out of that salvation comes our Christian hope. And we pray that you might make us men and women of hope who are shaped and guided by that hope which is ours, that one day we will see you face to face and we will sit at the wedding feast of the Lamb and we will enjoy the glories of heaven and your glory forever and ever. And so we pray that you might strengthen and encourage us now through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please keep your Bibles open, uh, if you will, at 1 Corinthians 15. Um, we're going to be talking over this week and weekend about heaven, hope and holiness, and I think there's a fair bit of confusion at times over, uh, over that topic. Many years ago, there was a, an English school teacher called Ernest Digweed, and uh, he lived in Portsmouth, and uh, when he died in 1976... He left a will with approximately forty to fifty thousand dollars in um, today's money, uh, and it was left under his will with instructions that the money should go to the Lord Jesus Christ upon suitable proof of his identity, in the event that Jesus should return to Earth within eighty years of Ernest Digweed's death in 1976. Uh, now, a couple of people did come forward claiming to be Jesus and asking for the money, but they were knocked back. Uh, Digweed's relatives eventually sued for the money and the courts agreed to give it to them, but only on the proviso that they took out an insurance policy, that they would pay back the money in the event that Jesus should return by 2056. Now, a will like that raises all sorts of interesting questions, doesn't it? Uh, how would Jesus prove his identity when he returned a second time? He wouldn't have a driver's license that was valid. He wouldn't have a passport. So how would you know that it was the Lord Jesus? What would he want money for? What would forty or $50,000 in today's money do for the Lord Jesus in the event of his return? After all, he's coming back as the King of Kings, as the Lord of Lords. It was a will, I think, that reflected a lot of the confusion that even today we have about heaven, about our Christian hope, and about the return of the Lord Jesus himself. In some ways, it's been hijacked, I think, by lots of debates about whether you're a pre-millennial, a post-millennial, an amillennial, a pan-millennial. Uh, I mean, if you, if you actually are a millennial, you'll be wondering why your demographic group has been hijacked by theologians. But, but those kinds of debates have often caused a lot more confusion than clarity, I think, as we as Christians have thought about our Christian hope. And I suspect, too, that the sheer pleasure and wealth of our community lull us into imagining that it's hard to imagine, isn't it, that things could be much better than they are. I mean, just look out the window. Uh, just, it's okay to just look out the window for a very brief moment. Okay, everyone back looking at me, thank you. Uh, but you see, the sun's out. Uh, we live in a peaceful society. It is a beautiful world that we live in. We live in God's own country. And sometimes I think the pleasure and the wealth of our own Australian society lulls us into a sense of complacency. How could things get any better? So why do I need a Christian hope? C.S. Lewis used to tell the um, story of a beggar who was walking down the street and as he came to a particular house, there was an open door. And on the step leading into the open door, there was a bowl of water and a loaf of bread. 
And the beggar, when he saw the bowl of water and the, and the loaf of bread, fell upon them hungrily and thirstily. And he sat at the doorstep of the open door, and he ate the bread and he drank the water, and he thought that he had everything he could possibly hope for. But unbeknownst to him, if he had simply gone through the door, inside was a feast laid out that was fit for royalty. But for the beggar, he was far too easily pleased. And in some ways, I think that's perhaps true of us as Christians. J.I. Packer certainly suggests that as Christians, we are far too easily pleased. That we have what he calls a misguided, misdirected, earthbound desire. That we, we think that this bowl of water and this bread that we eat is so good. How could we ever want more when in fact God has prepared for us in heaven a feast, a banquet that uh, passes all of our imaginations. So it may be that as Christians we are far too easily pleased and that is why we don't think too much about the glory of heaven. I think too sometimes we have been told that we need as Christians to be careful not to be so heavenly minded as to be of no earthly use. I don't know whether you've ever heard that statement. It used to be told to me quite often when I was young that you've got to be careful, Stuart, you must not be so heavenly minded that you will be of no earthly use. I think the idea behind it is that you'll be so focused on heaven that you actually will, will, will somehow not be of any particular help or benefit. You need to be more earthly minded. Nothing could be further from the truth, of course. It's a complete nonsense. The reality is that most of us are so earthly minded that we are of no heavenly use. And it is only as we are heavenly focused that our minds are sharpened into how we might serve men and women here on earth. Because our Christian hope frees us to serve and to sacrifice. Our Christian hope frees us to love and to invest. Because we know that there is a life to come. We know that there is a life to come that far surpasses any temporary benefit and blessing that we might lose today in our service of God and others. And so what I want us to do over these next three talks is just think a little bit about our Christian hope, not all of our hope, but just parts of it, what it is, uh, where does it come from, uh, how do you get it, and why is it good for us, not only when we die, but is good, how is it good for us right now today? in the way that we live our our lives. And we're going to begin with the basis of our Christian hope, which is 1 Corinthians 15. The next talk, we're going to be looking at the Christian hope and Christian discipleship from 2 Corinthians 4. And then tomorrow, we're going to be looking at our Christian identity and the way that it shapes the way how we live from Colossians chapter 3. But firstly, 1 Corinthians 15. So please have that open with you. There are just three things that Paul's doing in this passage. The first thing he does is he reminds his readers of the purpose of the gospel. He reminds his readers of the purpose of the gospel. Have a read in 1 Corinthians 15. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you were saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. And then down in um, verse 9, For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God, but by the grace of God I am what I am and his grace to me was not without effect. The the apostle reminds his readers of the purpose of the gospel. And the purpose of the gospel is to save. It's very simple, isn't it? But the purpose of the gospel is to save. Notice what he says in verse 2. By this gospel, by this good news message of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are saved. The gospel is not there primarily to morally improve you. The gospel is not there to make us more upright citizens, though it does do that. The purpose of the gospel primarily is to save. To save men and women 
from a judgment that is to come. Contrary to the materialism of our day, which regards the world as all there is, the Bible recognises that there is a world to come, a life beyond the grave. And what happens to us beyond the grave is dependent on what we do with Jesus in this life. Because the way that we live now has consequences into eternity. Because one, God will one day examine our lives and we will find that we have an enormous problem. And it's the problem, of course, of human sin. And it is that sin which God's gospel is intended to save us from. It's very awkward talking about sin these days. Uh, for many of us, certainly outside of the church, the idea of sin is a very antiquated doctrine. Even as Christians, I think we sometimes struggle to come to grips with what exactly it means when we say that I am a sinner. I had, um, when I was young, you might remember vinyl records. Anyone? Maybe you don't remember. You've probably seen them in retro shops and various things nowadays. But, um, yeah, so they, they have come back. Um, I had one of the largest re vinyl record collections in, um, in my town. I grew up in Port Macquarie. I think I had one of the largest collections that there was. Uh, I was very proud of it. The problem with my collection was that none of them were any good. Um, they were all scratched. Uh, I'd left some of them in the back seat of our car, and you might remember, if you know anything about vinyl, that if you leave them in the sun, they buckle. And so I had Bob Dylan Greatest Hits Volume 2, and you could only start playing at track 4 because there was a huge uh, bulge in the tracks 1, 2 and 3 all the way round. But none of that worried me, because what I had was a very cheap turntable on which I played them. And so you could play these, these scratched, cracked records, and it didn't make any difference. The sound was fine, because the needle was not sensitive enough to be able to pick up the details of the imperfections in the vinyl. A friend of mine, once, who had a very good and sophisticated uh, system, once foolishly invited me to bring some of my records around and he said, we'll play them this afternoon. I said, that'd be terrific, I'd love to. So I gathered up some of my favourite um, albums, Bob Dylan and Procol Harum and a range of others, and I took them around to my friend's place and he, he had one of those uh, turntables where the needle has a little cap that used to protect it. And you would take the cap off and you would carefully blow it on. It was a nightmare, absolute nightmare. Every scratch and imperfection in my records came through his large speakers with crystal clarity. In fact, that's all you could hear. All you could hear was a <laughs> sound of my records. Now, you see, in many ways, our lives are like that. When you play our lives out on the, on the cheap needle and turntable that is comparing with one another, our lives seem pretty good. You don't really notice the imperfections. But when you play our lives out on the turntable that is God's perfect holiness, every scratch, every imperfection in your life comes through with crystal clarity because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And that's what the Bible means when it talks about sin. Against the perfect Holiness of our God. Each one of us have lives which, which are so marred by our imperfections, by the scratches and, the, and, the, and the, the scars of our sin, that it is almost all that you can hear. And that is our problem. And it is why Paul is adamant that the gospel is good news because it is the message that saves us from our sin, saves us from ourselves, saves us from God's anger against our rebellion, saves us from eternal destruction in hell. So he says, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand, by this gospel you are saved. 
if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. Paul expands on this idea of being saved down in verses 9 and 10 when he uses himself as an illustration. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle. We know elsewhere in 1 Timothy chapter 1, he describes himself to Timothy as being the worst of all sinners, the chief of all sinners. He says, once I was a violent man, once I was a persecutor of the church, once I was blasphemous. And that description of Paul before he came to Christ is a pretty accurate one. In Acts chapter 7, he is this dark presence watching while Stephen is stoned to death and watching with approval as he sees Stephen stoned to death. In Acts chapter 8, we are told that he is going door to door, dragging Christian believers out of their homes, men, women and children, and throwing them into prison. He was a violent, persecuting, blasphemous man. And yet the gospel was sufficient to save even Paul, to cover his sin, his imperfections, his rebellion. Do you ever wonder whether God could forgive you? Are there things that have happened in your life that you're responsible for and you know about and perhaps nobody else knows about? But deep down, do you wonder, could God ever forgive me for this? It may be that you think if anyone else knew about them, they would not forgive you. But the question remains, could God forgive you? And the answer to that in the gospel is yes. Not maybe, not perhaps, not wait and see, but yes. Yes, you are forgiven because the gospel is good news because it saves you from your sin. That's why Paul says elsewhere it's like dynamite. It is that powerful to save sufficient to cover even the sins of someone like, like Paul and sufficient to cover the sins even of you and me. Grace, as Paul emphasises over and over again, the free, unmerited favour of God, the grace of God given to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me read to you from something that Martin Luther, who was the great German reformer of the 16th century, and uh, Protestant churches, of course, we all have our genesis in uh, his work. But let me read to you, it's a little bit long, but let me read it to you as to how he summarises it. Even if I lived and worked to eternity, my conscience would never be assured and certain how much it ought to do to satisfy God. For whatever work might be accomplished, there would always remain an anxious doubt, whether it pleased God or whether he required something more as the experience of all self-justifiers proves, and as I myself learned to my bitter cost. Even if I lived and worked to eternity, my conscience would never be assured and certain how much it ought to do to satisfy God. For whatever work might be accomplished, there would always remain an anxious doubt, whether it pleased God or whether he required more. But now... Since God has taken my salvation out of my hands and into his, making it depend on his choice, not mine, and has promised to save me, not by my own work, but by his grace and mercy, I am certain both that he is faithful and will not lie to me, and he is too great and powerful for any adversity to break him or snatch me away from him absolute certainty that you are saved through the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul wants us to understand, that the purpose of the gospel is to save. But secondly, he reminds his readers of the means of the gospel. Notice in verses 3 and 4, For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures and that he appeared to Peter and the twelve and after that to more than 500 of the brothers. 
Notice that, verses 3 and 4, that Christ died for our sins. Verse 3. Jesus, of course, as Christ, was the fulfilment of the Old Testament scriptures. They were looking forward to a coming Messiah or Christ, a deliverer, a saviour who would, who would rescue God's people. And it is Jesus who has come as the Christ, as the saviour, the Messiah, and he has saved us not through a military victory, not through, through the manipulation of a political process, but through his own death on the cross at Calvary a death of atonement, a death where Jesus took in himself the punishment for your sin and for mine, the sin which separated us from God. He removed it once and for all so that your sin, it's not swept under the carpet, it's not hidden away in a corner, it's not left outstanding. It is paid for in full. Completely, perfectly, once and for all, in the death of God's own Son. So that as Jesus hung upon the cross at Calvary all those years ago, all the guilt of everything that you and I had ever done was placed upon him, and the scriptures tell us that he who was without sin, no sin, became sin so that we might be forgiven, declared not guilty, and the barrier between us and God removed forever. Good news? That's terrific news, isn't it? It's the best news possible. But how do we know that it's true? Well, the third thing that Paul reminds his readers of is the proof of the gospel. We've seen the purpose of the gospel to save, The means of the gospel is that Christ has died for our sins. The proof of the gospel, notice verse 4, that he was buried, he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And Paul then goes on to stipulate all of the people who saw the risen Lord Jesus. So the first thing that Paul says about the resurrection of Jesus is that it is historical fact. The reason's clear, of course. Anyone can die. You don't have to be clever to die. But to rise from the dead, now that's another thing altogether, isn't it? The apostles in the early preaching in the book of Acts emphasised that they were witnesses, eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Jesus. They understood that this part of the gospel message that was the part that most people would find difficult to believe. And so they wanted to testify, we have seen him with our own eyes. We ate with him and we spoke with him. Jesus really did rise from the dead. Before I trained to become a pastor, I was a lawyer. And uh, the bulk of evidence, of course, in a court of law is the evidence of eyewitnesses. Even scientific uh, uh, evidence is, comes to court usually through the benefit of an eyewitness, an expert witness who was called to testify. But that's how, in courts of law, we prove that something is true. Eyewitness evidence, the testimony of those who were there, who saw and tasted and touched and heard and experienced. That is how we determine truth. And Paul wants us to understand that there is ample eyewitness evidence for the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And so he says that to Jesus, when he rose, he appeared to Peter and then to the 12 and after that to more than 500, most of whom are still alive, even though some have died, then to James, then to all the apostles and last of all, he said, he appeared to me on the road to Damascus. Tim Keller concludes that we are left with two hard to refute facts that the tomb of the Lord Jesus was empty and that hundreds of people saw him risen from the dead. Now, Paul is emphatic about the historical evidence for the resurrection because he understands that if the resurrection of Jesus is not true, if it's a myth or wishful thinking, 
then without the resurrection of Jesus, the whole Christian faith crumbles and fails. Without the resurrection, there can be no hope for the future. Because Paul's second point is that the resurrection of Jesus guarantees that we are forgiven. Again, in verses 12 to 19, if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. Corinth was full of problems, we know that. And one of the problems appears to have been that some were claiming that there was no resurrection of the dead. Perhaps they argued that it was a spiritual resurrection but rejected the idea of a physical resurrection. Perhaps they denied in an afterlife altogether that they were like many in our own communities who have a purely material view of life. You only live once and when your body, when you die, it will rot and that is the end of things. Paul summarises that way of thinking by saying, well, if that's true, down in verse 32, let's eat, drink and be merry. Let's make the most of this fleeting world. Let's suck the orange dry because death will soon overtake us and it will render every way that we have lived meaningless and insignificant if there is no resurrection. Whatever their reasoning behind it, Paul rejects it. And his argument goes like this. He says, if you say that the dead are not raised, then what you're saying is that Jesus is not raised. And if Jesus is not raised, notice in verse 14, our preaching is useless, but so also is your faith. He says it again down in verse 17. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. And just in case you missed it, he says, you are still in your sins. If Christ is not raised, then you've been saved from nothing. You see, if Jesus died and simply remained dead, buried, left in the ground for his body to rot, then like every man or woman before and since, Jesus has simply come, suffered the consequences of sin, which is death. There's nothing to indicate that his death was anything other than the same as your death will be or mine. So there can be no atonement for sin. No death in our place, no forgiveness. But by raising Jesus from the dead, God declared that his death was no ordinary death. By raising Jesus from the dead, God declared Jesus to be his own son, Romans 1. By raising Jesus from the dead, God declared that the sacrifice of Jesus in your place and mine was acceptable to God. And therefore your sins are truly forgiven. And the great consequence of sin, death, has been defeated because Jesus rose from the dead. The first fruits is how Paul describes it, of those who have died. Because the resurrection of Jesus guarantees that your Christian faith is true. The third thing is that the resurrection of Jesus guarantees that we also will rise from the dead. This is verses 20 to 28. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. When um, one of our daughters owned a little farm down just out of Yass for a number of years, and uh, when she first bought it, there were a number of, um, it was winter, and there were a number of um, trees down there that, that, that were basically sticks. So they stood about this high, they had some branches, but they had no leaves, nothing on them. And uh, any stick looks just like any other stick when it's stuck in the ground. And so we all look at them, and not even Pauline, who knows everything about plants, not even Pauline knew what the trees were. Um, now, how do you tell? Well, the answer is you wait. Uh, you wait until spring comes, and you begin to watch what forms. And so as each of them budded, and the leaves came out, and the blossoms began, and the fruit began to form, each of those fruit trees was able to be identified by its first fruits. That's how first fruits work. You pluck that first apple and you eat it and you say, ah, it's an apple tree or a pear tree 
or whatever fruit tree it may be. And Paul says that Jesus rose from the dead as the first fruits, the first apple picked from the tree that holds all the promise of a harvest to come, that Jesus rose from the dead and in his resurrection he holds all of the promise of the resurrection that is to come for you and for me. In other words, the resurrection of Jesus guarantees your hope. It assures us that Jesus did die for our sins and that we will rise with him. And so he says in verse 21, For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own turn, Christ the firstfruits, and then when he comes, those who belong to him. The next couple of talks we're going to be looking at the way in which that impacts how you live today. But I want to conclude by focusing on both the comfort of our Christian hope but also the dark side of our hope. That the gospel saves us from our sin. It is guaranteed in the resurrection of Jesus and one day you will die and you will rise to be with him forever. There is great comfort in the hope that is ours in Christ. Uh, many years, 20 years, 20 odd years ago now, uh, I stood at the graveside of a very good friend of mine. He'd been my best man at our wedding and uh, he was 40. Uh, he was diagnosed with cancer uh, in February and he was dead by July. It was a savage reminder. The rain had been pouring down in Sydney for weeks and weeks at that stage, so wet that at the sides of the grave were falling in as we stood around the graveside and, and conducted the, the, the funeral service. As I trudged back from the graveside, I thought how achingly sad was Greg's death, but there was no despair. Never was resurrection hope so real because resurrection hope gives us comfort that death is not the end but there is life to come. And it brings great comfort for those who die in Christ. It brings great comfort for those of us who remain that there is a life to come that no matter how short this life may be cut, or how long it may be, there is a resurrection hope that cannot perish, spoil or fade, but is kept for us in heaven. It is a hope in times of suffering too that brings us great comfort. I've always loved the story. I read it many years ago about a missionary who was working in uh, West Africa. And uh, at the time there was a, a lot of, quite a number of, of very impoverished refugee camps near where he was ministering. And uh, in the morning he had been visiting one of those camps and he had seen just a little bit of the, of the terrible tide of human suffering that was there. And in the afternoon he was lecturing students on the uh, return of the Lord Jesus. And he was dealing with that passage in 1 Thessalonians where uh, we're told that uh, with a great shout the Lord Jesus will return. And uh, one of his students put up his hand and he said, what's he going to shout? And the missionary said, I'd never been asked that question. I'd never even thought about that question. What's he going to shout? But then he said, I thought about the visit that I had made that morning to the refugee camps. And I thought about the dislocation and the suffering and the disease and the hunger that I had seen there that morning. And I said to the student, he will shout, enough. Enough pain, enough heartache, enough suffering, enough death, enough when Jesus returns. No more tears, no more crying, no more grief, no more pain. Justice will be done and the savagery inflicted by sin will be ended forever. Tim Keller tells of a lady in his church who was chronically ill 
And whenever she was asked how she was, she replied, nothing the resurrection won't cure. There's great comfort, isn't there, in Christian hope. But finally, there is a dark side to Christian hope. Paul only alludes to it in chapter 15 of of 1 Corinthians. He's more explicit if you go over in your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. He says in verse 6, God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power. That's the dark side of our Christian hope. It's why when we sing songs that rejoice in heaven and rejoice in the hope that is ours, those songs must always be tinged with a sadness for that judgment which will come upon those who do not know the Lord Jesus. Because God is not mocked. And if Jesus does not save someone from their sins, then they will bear in themselves the punishment of God upon their sin. And what a terrible day that will be. Revelation says that it will be people will call on the very rocks of the mountains to fall on themselves. Such will be the terror of that final day. Do you pray for the lost? Because your Christian hope must drive you to your knees to pray for those who do not yet have such hope. It was Jesus who told us to pray that the Lord of the harvest might raise up workers. Paul who spoke about how blessed are the feet of those who bring the gospel of good news. Do you pray for the lost? Do you pray, Lord, take me and send me, use me to speak to others of the Lord Jesus and his gospel of grace? Does the hope of heaven bring you comfort? But does it also remind you of your responsibility to pray and to proclaim and to go? So hope. Uh, Let me conclude by reminding you about, um, there's a guy called Richard Baxter who was a 17th century Christian leader known as a Puritan. They were very, very methodical people, the Puritans. They organised systems for everything in terms of their Christian life. He was a very effective pastor in a little village called Kidderminster and his model of pastoral care uh, is followed even today by many. But he was a dreadful hypochondriac. Uh, Often he thought he was dying. Most of his life he thought he was about to die. It was just the way he lived. In 1646 he lay ill and expecting to die Uh, He didn't, but he expected that he would. And so he set himself to spend half an hour every day meditating on heaven. He would take up the many passages of scripture about heaven and he would meditate on them, store them in his heart and mind, reflect on them, pray over them. He wanted to make himself heavenly minded for the heaven that he would one day enter. J.I. Packer called such meditation heartwarming, head-clearing, invigorating discipline. I wonder if you do that. Maybe you're not a Puritan, you don't want to spend half an hour every day. Do you spend half an hour a week reflecting on heaven, on all those glorious images that the Bible have as a wedding banquet, a place where the lion will lie down with the lamb, a place where there will be no more tears or grief or crying or shame, a place where, as Paul says in Romans 5, the glory of God will be revealed. The very godness of God will be made known in heaven. His mercy and compassion and grace and justice and faithfulness and kindness and gentleness and majesty, that all of those things will be made known when we see him face to face in heaven. Perhaps the reason why we struggle 
to be encouraged by hope is that we simply don't think about it enough. So let me encourage you, be a Puritan. Be ordered, disciplined, methodical and painstaking in the way that you approach heaven. J.I. Packer said that our Western worldliness dulls our sense of God at every point and where the sense of God grows dim, thoughts of heaven grow dim also. But the antidote is to spend time reflecting on your heavenly hope. Let's pray. Now, Father, we do thank you for our hope. We thank you that it is made certain in the Lord Jesus Christ who not only died for our sins but was raised to new life. We thank you that it is a hope that brings us comfort and encouragement. And we thank you that it is a hope which drives us to pray for those who are lost. Help us to reflect upon it, we pray, that we would not be so earthly minded as to be of no heavenly use, but as our hearts and minds are fixed upon heaven, so you might enable us to live well for you today. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.